Hola, ¿qué tal? Eh, muchas gracias por la invitación. Eh, estoy con, muy emocionado por participar en este evento. Voy a charla eh, en inglés simplemente para tener un poco más de eh, scope en, en la audiencia que pueda ver estos videos. Eh, pero cualquier cosa que necesite preguntarme, por favor, eh, háganmelo saber. So, yeah, the title of this talk is Introduction to Bayesian Modeling with PyMC. Uh, and I guess there are many instances where you can actually learn about this topic to give kind of a different flavor, especially thinking about the applications that I'm working on in the marketing domain. So why Bayesian modeling? I want to give just kind of my point of view on what kind of drives my interest in these type of methods. First of all, is that there's a kind of very transparent way of how interpret a uh, probability and also how to think about that. Uh, I think that will be a little bit clear through the examples. Something that is very useful, especially for decision making, is uncertainty quantification. So in general, we're not interested in a kind of a point prediction or point estimate of a model, but we really want to understand, let's say, of which degree do we, do we trust this and let's say how much variance are we not able to explain. Uh, something which is very useful as well in concrete applications is to allow to include prior knowledge uh, into the model. This is uh, important when you don't have a lot of data, uh, you still have some business domain or some specific theory behind it, so you can actually put that into, into your model uh, without seeing the data, and this becomes very, very handy. Uh, it's very flexible, and I've seen uh, many applications on these methods in both academia and industry. And last but not least, uh, kind of it's scalable and, and kind of connect this to kind of the framework that I'm going to present here, which, by the way, is not the only framework for Bayesian modeling. Uh, but I've been lately kind of involved in, in learning about this project, and it's PyMC. And very recently, they had a very important release a, around kind of the backend and the computational engine. So for the ones who know, it's actually a, able to, to all do these optimizations with JAX, which is a very a very popular a, a library. And I think we had a talk about it last, uh, yeah, yesterday. Uh, so it scales quite well. So you can run this, these uh, models on GPU. And also there was a lot of work uh, around kind of the network uh, and the, the graph optimization behind it. So please check it out. Again, it's not the only framework, but I'm going to just try to, to, to explain how to, to do this type of models in, in PyMC. So as the time is quite short, I cannot give a, kind of a very thorough introduction into the theory, but we are less interested about the kind of math and more interested about kind of, let's say, giving you a flavor of what you can do with this type of model. So as a remainder of what's the core of, of this kind of method, it's the Bayesian, uh, it's based theorem. So let, let us go through, it through an example. So suppose you are in a train or in a bus and you see someone with long hair and then you would like to estimate the probability for that person uh, being a woman. So we have two events. The event A is being a woman, and the event B is uh, having long hair. And we want to estimate the probability of A given B, which is precisely what you see. So someone with a, a probability of being a woman, given that it has long hair. So, and this is where kind of you need to make some assumptions about, about kind of the world. So this is a toy example, and in this case, I'm going to assume that like finding a, male, a, a woman or a man is equally possible. So the probability of a woman is 0.5. Uh, I also believe that in general, people or like it's a, a kind of esti a guesstimate, so to say, that there's slightly pe less people with long hair. So I'm going to assume like the, the the probability of having in general someone with long hair is 0.4, and yet another kind of information that I would to, to add into the kind of computation is the probability of someone uh, having long hair if it's, if it's a woman. And I think I would say that 0 0.7, let's say slightly above uh, 0 0.5 could be a, a good uh, kind of approximation. So given that information that again is not coming from the world, but it's something that I kind of assume, then I can just plug this into this formula. So the actual probability that we made of a woman having a long hair is just take the product of this kind of prior probability of being a woman, which is 0 0.5, times the probability of someone having long hair if it's a woman, 
0.7, and I divide this by the probability of someone having long hair. And yeah, the number is not important, it's around 0 0.87. And that's usually how you, you use Bayes' theorem. You start with a model, you have prior information, and then you kind of invert the, the inference step, which in this case was trying to find this P A, a given B. Uh, but in general, when we're trying to do data analysis, we don't care about kind of a specific use case, but we're interested into certain type of kind of distribution or, or population uh, behavior. And we encode this through probability distributions. So here I'm going to show you a couple of them, uh, some of which could be familiar for you. Uh, so let's go, let's say, bit by bit. So uh, the first one in blue is the usual kind of Gaussian or normal distribution, which parameterized by the mean, which we call here mu and the uh, standard deviation uh, sigma and this i'm just plotting a standard one and uh, the area under this curve should always add to one we have another one a uh, laplace distribution and has also parameters mu and sigma but this one actually has kind of a strange uh, figure and it peaks at zero very sharply uh, there's another one which is called student T, and it's pretty similar to the normal distribution, but it has another degree of uh, another parameter nu, which kind of uh, encodes a kind of the fat tail. So the, the student T distribution is a distribution that has fatter tails than the normal distribution. And the last example uh, is the half normal, which is actually just the normal distribution in blue, but you just cut it in half. And as these distributions need to, like the area needs to add up to one, then of course this one gets a little bit taller just because it's chopping half of it. So what it's important and the message here is that the many distributions that appear in practice are parameterized by certain uh, sort of parameters uh, which we would like to learn. So this is actually how would one uses the Bayesian theorem or Bayesian approach in, in data analysis. So this one is a, it's the only uh, kind of math slide. So and again, it's not very important. What is important is the concept. So the Bayesian approach through the, to data analysis is the following. Assume you have a population Y uh, from a given distribution, let's say a normal distribution. That, let's say you're trying to estimate the heights of the person. A, of a sample of, of people and there's two parameters which is the mean mu and the standard deviation sigma and you would like to estimate this from the population so you can actually use the exact same formula as we did in the in the first example uh, but here we're using the parameters and the data so what you would like to actually estimate is the distribution of the parameter a uh, given the data so the data is thought as being given so this is the base theorem, but that doesn't say much. Let us kind of zoom in into the specific factors. So the first factor here is the probability of the data given the parameter, uh, and this is called the likelihood function. So this is something that you actually compute, and, and given the data, this is some, something that a computer can do for you. Uh, the second term is what is called a prior distribution for theta. So this is kind of the domain knowledge. Uh, that you want to to impute. So, for example, if you think your parameters are always positive or they're uh, bounded in a certain domain, here's where you put such information, and and that's pretty much it. So, in in kind of the the message is that whenever you want to do inference on kind of data analysis in the in the patient world, you kind of need to just work with the likelihood function, which is let's say how the data fits your parameter, and the prior, which is more about constraining your parameter space. We, of course, forgot the denominator, and this is kind of a, something that you could, in principle, forget about just because this is something that does not depend on theta, and it's actually just a weighted average. It's a normalization factor. So it's not that very important, but you do need to compute it. And computing integrals is very hard. And what PyMC and all of these patient frameworks offer you are kind of numerical ways of uh, approximating these uh, kind of posterior distributions uh, by just taking samples out of it. So this is a super big area and it's super interesting, but uh, as part of the stock, I'm not going to go into it. We're just gonna learn how to use PyMC and uh, interpret the results. But let us go um, to a very, very specific and tangible example, which is a linear regression. So I'm assuming a lot of the attendees are actually, might be interested in machine learning. So, and the ones that are not, maybe linear regression, it's a good place to, uh, to where you can understand these concepts. So let us go through a specific example. So we have two variables, which are X and Y, 
and you have a certain points and you would like to fit the best line uh, through these points. And we have a training data and uh, where you want to do the, the, the fit, so to say, and on the test data, you want to evaluate the out of, out of sample accuracy. So uh, we're going to model this uh, as, uh, the, as follows. So we're going to assume that our uh, observations uh, are normally distributed with a mu, uh, mean mu and standard deviation sigma. And the mu, which is here, the mean actually changes over x. And I stole this, uh, this picture from, a, from, from the book. I'll share the slides and, and you can look through it uh, because I think it's very transparent about, let's say, how to think about kind of the, the, the line fit and the distribution. So for each point x, we're thinking about which is the best distribution that we can fit uh, along this line. So this is what we would like to, to understand. And this is how we uh, write our model. So mathematically, we just need to specify, let's say, what do we want to get? So we want to just a uh, kind of estimate the a which is the intercept and b which is the slope which in this simulated case i know the true values it will need some prior information on the parameters and this is kind of the where i can put the domain knowledge so in this case i'm not going to be kind of very a uh, picky about it and i'm going to take a uh, for a and b normal distributions uh, with mean zero, so I'm allowing them to be both positive and negative, and let's say a standard deviation of two, which is rather kind of wide, so it's not very restrictive. What is interesting is that for the sigma a parameter, I, sh I, I cannot use a normal because I know that this has always uh, positive values. So for this, I'm going to use a half normal, which is this, this uh, distribution that you chop down in the middle and you just take the positive side. And that's it. The, the, the next step would be how to write this in, in PyMC. And actually, this is exactly the same way. So this is how a, a PyMC model would look like. But of course, let us go now into the details. So we start with a context manager, like a, a, a width statement in Python, where you can gonna write the whole logic. And this IDX variable is just a convenient index variable, which is not very important. So the first thing is you store you you define your data containers. This is not necessarily let's say kind of strictly necessary, but it's often useful when you want to do out of sample prediction. So if you would pass a numpy array or a pandas data frame, this will work uh, equally well. So I have x and a y, which are my two input variables. Then I have the priors, and notice kind of the beauty of it is that the mathematical kind of formulation or like a expression is translated very transparently through the priors. So you take A and B distributions with priors a, a mu equals zero and sigma equal two. And for the standard deviation, you take a half normal a, a, with sigma equal two. So it's actually the same thing as we saw before. Then the next step is to parameterize your model, meaning which shape do you want to allow for your data points? And I'm calling here a deterministic distribution which is nothing else as a kind of a container just to track something there's no distribution whatsoever and in this case is a, you just tell the model okay just compute the intercept plus b times x and the last thing you'll need to do is to say is to specify what's your model of the data which as we saw before it was a normal distribution a, and i call that which is precisely the likelihood so here the data kind of we haven't used the data at all because this is justification so something that you can actually do and it's kind of part of the bayesian workflow of doing bayesian analysis is to sample from this kind of parameterization without feeding the data so that means uh, this is your prior belief so you can just take samples so you can take a sample of a a sample of b out of these distributions a, a sample of sigma then take a plus bx and just uh, use that as taking another sample of a normal distribution with a sigma that is coming from your prior step. And I mean, there's nothing forbid, uh, forbidding you about doing so. And I know some people actually might be familiar with scikit learn so I'm gonna link uh, that to scikit model. So this should in principle give you the same fit as the linear regression object in, in scikit learn so when you do this prior simulation step uh, you are not feeding the data you are just seeing what 
does the model actually think it's possible uh, when actually uh, you, you give this parameterization? So you see the points in, in black, you see a random line that I choose in red, uh, you see kind of all of the, I sample this a hundred times, so it's very wide. Uh, but it's still within a range which is kind of uh, not too wide, so I'm not taking values of a million or, or a thousand, but they're kind of bounded between zero and five. So I think it's, it's, it's not very restrictive, but it's also not very crazy. So now when you have this uh, model specification, what you do is to pass the, uh, the, the feeder or the sampler, and what PyMC is going to do for you, and it's going to do a lot of things, but uh, in essence, it's sample, a, and extract the best distribution of your parameters A, B, and sigma, which actually fit your data uh, better. So again, this is a this is a very interesting topic, which actually has a lot of geometry and a lot of theory behind, and it's a quite a active area of research. But I'm not going to go into the detail. Let's say as a PyMC user, it's enough to know that you can actually run this uh, PM sample uh, over your model, and then you just simply predict. Uh, so on the right hand side, I'm just showing you the posterior distribution of the mean, which is a, kind of a, these colored lines. And in, in red, I'm showing a square. Uh, so they're pretty, pretty consistent. I would still argue that the, the, it's nice that kind of the, the, the credible intervals around the corners get a little bit wider because you are less certain about that as compared to here in the middle. So still, this is giving you much more information. But in addition, the, the model actually gives you the whole kind of uncertainty across your data, right? Because, and this is one of the things that when working on pure machine learning, you're often forgetting, or maybe people don't pay enough attention, is the fact that you're just learning kind of a curve, but you, 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 by presenting this line, you're still losing a lot of information. And for decision making, having the whole uncertainty, a kind of a, um, interval, it's, it's very, very important. A, and then we can estimate the out of sample a, a fit, and it looks quite well in, in, in our data set. So, so far, so good. There has been nothing fancy, but now I'm going to just give you some examples on how you can fine tune your model to actually make it better for your specific use case. And everything goes into kind of the distribution selection. So one thing that you could do is, for example, let's say constrain the, the slope. So if you're, for example, like trying to estimate a, a weight as a function of height, you see that this, is, this should be correlated. Uh, and that's uh, why uh, it, it could be feasible to allow not a normal distribution, but a half normal, meaning this should always be positive. And in scikit-learn, you can actually uh, do something similar by restricting your coefficients to be always positive. Uh, you can also try to add what is called regularizations, and it's try to shrink your parameters to zero so that kind of you, you avoid overfit, you avoid just learning the data too well. And this is actually what you do by, instead of having a normal distribution, just putting a Laplace prior, which it was this one, which picks very hard at zero, so that you tell the model, okay, I'm very convinced that it's, let's say, let's push this to zero, and we push this away from zero if we have a strong evidence. So this is a flavor of regularization, and it's pretty related to L2, or what is called rich regularization in, in scikit learn. And actually, a, 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 another parameter, a, nu, in this case, and you can, instead of using a normal likelihood, use a student T. And, and this new is going to model the, the, the degrees of freedom, which actually encode how fat these tails are. And this comes very handy if you have outliers, right? Because then if, you, if, the, if the tails are a little bit fatter, then the model won't care as much as kind of these outliers or points away from the distribution as you would in a normal distribution. So this is a kind of a what is called robust regression where you are kind of a more kind of a or these this these uh, models are going to be less sensitive uh, to huge outliers so i mean i show you how this works as a linear regression model so i hope you 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 got a flavor out of it but i also so show you that you could actually do this uh, from 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 other kind of classical ml algorithms so so why to bother so this is an experiment, this following example that I'm going to show you, uh, which I actually presented at PyData Global last year. Uh, and it was more about 
kind of interpretable machine learning. For me and in my day-to-day -day work, it's not enough to have a black box model, but it's really important to be able to understand how the models generate predictions. And I use this as a, as a toy model to explore certain techniques. So, and I'm going to show you how, how, how one could apply a, a Bayesian model in a kind of non-standard way. So let us go problem and into the data. The problem is kind of relatively simple. You have a time series, and this represents the count of bikes rented in a specific city. So these are numbers which are always positive. Um, and then you see a clear kind of positive trend, and you have a yearly seasonality. I mean, people usually bike less in winter, let's say, uh, probably assuming they have a kind of strong seasonality. And if you see temperature, uh, it actually seems to correlate quite well. So we would like to predict the kind of bikes as a function of temperature, and actually we have other other covariates and regressors. So as a baseline model, what we do is just simply fit a linear regression in the same favor as before, and this is what I did. I have temperature here, and it's the variable that I would like to understand, but I have other type of information, for example, the wind speed, I have an artificial trend, humidity, I have an intercept, and two categorical variables which indicate whether there was a working day or not, and how, let's say, weather condition, which is bad, medium, or, or really bad. And then I the, the model, it's kind of written in the same way as I showed before, and then you will just uh, fit the model and, and get the results. So this is what you would get, and overall looks quite good. I mean, this is an in-sample fit, but still it's worth looking into it. But something that I noticed is uh, around July, 211, actually the bike counts go down when the temperatures go quite high. But we still believe that the temperature and the bike counts should or like seem to be positively correlated. So it seems that, let's say by just looking to this graph, it seems that because it could be noise, but actually if you go deeper, you will see that you can always find these type of cases uh, around summer. So it could be that the relation between temperature and the uh, bike counts is actually a little bit more complex, of course, given the other uh, model regressors. So something that I did to try to explain that, and this is I do it in my Pi Global, uh, Pi Data Global uh, uh, year, so you can check it out in the links, is to trade two type of machine learning models. One is a linear regression, as before, but I added second order interactions. So I just took a, a lot of combinations just to make to, to make this model a little bit more complex, uh, so that I could fit the data in a little bit better. And I also use an, an XGBoost model, which is a tree-based model. Not very important at the moment, but uh, I went just to to kind of show you which type of results I found. Uh, these are what are called uh, IC plots or partial dependency plots, and are a way of kind of scikit-learn offers a way of trying to understand the effect of one variable into the model. So it's trying to kind of go into this uh, model agnostic ML algorithms. So let's focus on here on the first plot where you have temperature on the x-axis and the kind of predictions on the y-axis. And then with you, what you would like to do is to kind of shuffle a bit the temperature and see how actually this changes uh, the prediction. So the two models are colored in a uh, blue and orange. So the first model, which is a linear model, it's the blue one. And on average, we see the temperature uh, it has a positive impact on the bike's uh, kind of uh, prediction. And this is to be expected, but actually if you see some individual points, so the, the, the bold line is the average, but some individual points actually going the other way around. So we'll, we'll take a look at that in, in, in a second. But uh, interestingly, the XGBoost model actually has this very nice saturation curve. So the model actually learned that actually there's a positive a kind of relation between the temperature and the bike count and after around kind of 25 degrees then this goes down so actually the high, like after 25 degrees then this seems to have a negative effect and by zooming in by constricting this constraining this uh, plot uh, for the month of july then one actually see that this relation is always negative so there's something around summer on which given the other kind of features a uh, temperature seems to be uh, having a negative uh, relation with the uh, with the bike counts. 
Uh, so that was a nice discovery, but I still believe like a linear regression with interactions is a very big model. You have a lot of variables, and also XGBoost models are often hard to interpret. And I, I thought I wanted to kind of, I, I did an experiment specifically for this talk, and I will share that with you uh, on the reference to try to do something a little bit different. So what I tried to do is to have a same linear regression model with one difference. And the one difference is that I didn't choose, like for the temperature uh, feature, I didn't choose kind of a, a parameter, like a beta coefficient, which, which is null, or like a regression coefficient, but I, I'm allowing this coefficient to vary over time using what is called a Gaussian random walk. So a Gaussian random walk is nothing else as taking kind of an ultra aggressive term. Uh, from the previous estimation of the uh, kind of regression coefficient, which now depends over time. Let's say I don't want to go into details, but kind of PyMC allows you to run this model in a kind of fairly straightforward way. Uh, and the intuition behind is that the relation between temperature and bike counts is, is nonlinear. Uh, so this is the fit. So it, it looks a little bit better, but of of course, maybe in sample fits are not just the only thing that we should look. But I just then I, I decided to plot uh, the effects as a function of temperature. So this uh, plot has a very interesting information. Let me go through it um, in some detail. So on the x-axis, you have uh, the temperature, uh, which goes between let's say minus five to thirty. So probably it's a country where there's a, a quite a seasonal uh, and a kind of a period and the effect is kind of a, what you would get from a, or like the beta coefficient so to say in in, in this case so for the base model the, this is flat because it, you have just one coefficient for temperature i uh, and it it's around 0.5 uh, yeah and um, and then the other dots are actually coming from this kind of time varying coefficient model so for each point, I actually have one coefficient, which is a, a little bit hard to, to, to grasp, but this is what a Gaussian random walk is doing for you. So I color coded these points by month. So we clearly see, because we see the cluster of colors, that the effect of temperature on bikes is seasonal, as we expected. And what we see actually, this gray dashed line is zero, is that after 25 degrees, there are some days especially for uh, July and June, that means summertime, on which the effect is negative. Also, it's interesting to see that kind of the, the variance of these effects actually change over time. So around five degrees, actually this varies a lot and it probably has to do with the fact that all the covariates are also, also varying a lot. But after kind of 25 degrees, and if it's July or June, like it's just too hot, people, uh, probably are not uh, brave enough to to bike those days and one can actually plot this uh, as a function of time and this is actually the plot above which is the effect the estimated effect of temperature on bikes so we see here that in july it's always below zero and this is uh, the raw input data which is the temperature uh, which is a very interesting uh, kind of a uh, aspect because kind of we are seeing seasonality through the time varying coefficients of temperature in bike camps. And I actually like this model a lot. It gives kind of a very similar results to the other uh, ML models, but it gives you it gives you a much more transparent, let's say a less complex model and also uncertainty estimation. So I just want to end with like and so what this seems like a very fancy and probably unnecessary toy model. But actually, this is coming very handy in various applications. And I just want to mention one, uh, which is the one that I have been working uh, for a couple of months already. And this is what it's called a media mix model. So in marketing, uh, let's say you, you have some sales, you have conversion, you have a target variable that you want kind of to, to try to explain. And, and you have a lot of input which are kind of driving this. And these actually relations can be very complex. So think about, for example, if you uh, have a, a TV ad and then you would like to estimate what's the effect of TV 
uh, media spend into sales, right? And the problem is that you can you don't have cookies or you ha don't have kind of a kind of deterministic attribution to actually tie kind of an impression into a specific conversion. So what people actually do is to try to estimate it statistically. And if you think about it, like uh, having a like a, if you think about TV a campaign, they usually have a big start and then this kind of fades over time. But you probably don't see some like a, a spike on sales. Uh, the first day they are the campaign, but this is something that is accumulating over time. And uh, what I'm trying to understand is how this affects and actually across many channels, because it's not TV, you have Facebook, you have YouTube, uh, Google, and other kind of factors like seasonality to, to how these things mix together uh, to, to explain that. And, and it's not just to explain, but once you know how the relationship works, you want to optimize. And actually this is how companies uh, will spend, uh, save a lot of money. So in this case, we, uh, I don't want to go into details. I'll show you the reference, but uh, we're running kind of the same kind of linear regression in a very similar spirit as I, as I showed you before, but then, you, you can actually tailor your 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 model to to have very custom transformation which you would like to control and also certain uh, type of prior information which could be handy for your model so when you're trying to model media spend uh, and, and try to understand the effect there are various type of effects one of it is the carryover or ad stock effect which is how it, yeah and how this kind of changes over time or how, what's the carryover of the media across time so if you watch the, your tv ad uh, how this reflected in a week or two then you have a saturation effect because maybe you spend a lot on one day but this is going to be let's say not linearly meaning if you if you double that or half that the effect of sales is going to be different and also you can allow these kind of effects to vary over time and that's why you could for example could put a gaussian random walk on, on it and what you would get at the end is this type of effect curve and especially here one on the right on the left which is a saturation curve and this is will tell you from the data that you are not putting anything in my hand but just by kind of a, a appropriate parameterization of your model let's say where your media spend or like how it does the saturation curve of your media spend would look uh, from historical data and you have you know if you have this for many channels you can actually optimize this because this is actually saturating and this is a uh, very valuable for companies these days when privacy uh, is becoming more and more strict so there are many many, exam many more examples and applications i will just encourage you to look into the pymc gallery uh, there are many interesting use cases very complete uh, a b testing uh, regression analysis, Gaussian processes. I mean, it, it's very nice and it has been, been very recently updated. Uh, I'll share these slides with you. Also, I'll share the notebook uh, on the kind of linear regressions and the bike example. I, write, I wrote a little blog post about it. So yeah, check out the links. There are many of them. I think most of them uh, are available online. And I actually also added uh, a a, a podcast on which they discuss about applications uh, and, and it's quite quite fun to read so without further ado thank you very much it was really nice to, to share this with you and hopefully uh, yeah you you'll get into these topics and if you ever have a, a question around it or if you need some reference just let me know